well, uh, I'm really, really, really happy to share what I do for a living because of course, you know, with the 99s, it's all female pilots, right? And, um, you know, if you look at an aeroplane, there is what, like a million different part numbers attached to an aeroplane, which, you know, these parts need to be engineered, manufactured, repaired, uh, uh, you name it, right? So there is more to life than just the, the cockpit, you know? And there's obviously a massive support industry that supports uh, airlines and operators and so on and so on. And um, I'm always a bit on a quest of, you know, sharing what's involved in um, the world of logistics, specifically AOG logistics. So, when you, I mean, I'm talking a little bit pre-COVID, but um, I am pretty sure that this will still apply, um, you know, in certain industries more so than ever right now, business aviation being one. When we come out of this, you know, hopefully, you know, with, air, with air, a lot of airlines are facing aircraft out, you know, and then are operating on a much smaller scale. So I strongly believe that there will always be room for, um, you know, the type of service that my company offers. So I'm Karen Muller. I work for Sterling Global Aviation Logistics, which is part of Kuhn & Nagel. We were acquired in January of last year. Kuhn & Nagel is one of the biggest freight forwarders on the planet. What happens, right? You might have an aircraft that is on ground. And of course, what now? You know, because if you look at having an aircraft grounded, um, you are looking at obviously a lot of cost involved, um, you know, and you're looking at a major, major operational impact. So obviously aircraft is grounded, what happens now, right? So tech ops, maintenance, engineering, um, you know, they will check everything out. They'll say, oh my God, you know, good news. It's not a big problem, we can fix it. Or it is whatever, it's a big problem, small problem, doesn't matter, but we can fix it. Um, stores gets involved and it's like okay that's great but of course as in so many instances we have stock but we don't have stock of that particular unit that you require to fix this situation then purchasing gets involved and says okay good news you know i was able to find the part for you but the bad news is it's completely on the other side of the planet so what are we gonna do you know so then um in the meantime, operations is obviously, you know, saying, hey, what's going on? We've got 300 passengers, you know, do we have a spare aircraft? No, we don't. How are we going to fix this? Um, revenue management, you know, has kittens because they're saying, OMG, you know, not only are we losing turnover for this flight, we've got to put up people in a hotel. It's going to cost us a fortune because, you know, um, if it's a European registered airline, for example, they even have to pay compensation for the amount of time you are being delayed. And it's broken down by, you know, up to two hours, six hours, etc., etc. So, of course, the airline stands to lose a lot, a lot of money if that asset is, you know, not being uh, uh, utilized. And then, of course, customer service, you know, they're getting screamed at and yelled at by the passengers, you know, all the rebookings and God knows what that have to happen. And like I mentioned, you know, the law. So what do you do when you have this situation going on? Only solution is you call on your Sterling AOG heroes. And who might they be, you might ask? So, like I said, quick group of companies. So I work for Sterling. We only focus on AOG transportation. We have a sister called Quickstat, which is our life science division. And it couldn't have come at a better time when I was in the ops call today, somebody was saying, yeah, you know, um, we are currently doing a shipment to Malawi. And I'm like, what? Malawi? <laughs> and I said, what? How? What is it about? And so basically, the Population Health Research Institute is currently funding and managing a massive clinical trial study um, whereby lots of different African continents are working together. And I think, I think the project is called Project Victory. So I don't know if you've heard of that or not, but basically what we're doing right now is there's a very urgent shipment um, that is um, has to come 
in um, you know with dry eyes um, the box has to stay within a certain temperature environment for four days and things like that so of course what do they do how are we going to get it to Malawi right so they have to find solutions what is the quickest routing what is the fastest option so it's coming in on Kenyan Airways via Nairobi um, leaving I believe the UK so I was so happy to hear that you know and that is basically an example where life science uh, is the same principle as AOG but of course there is life attached to it you know um, in New York we, we, we move human organs around you know all these um, uh, motorcycle guys that you see with the you know with the human organs that's part of Sterling um, so it's all very critical what we do um, and then you have a bit of high-tech and automotive included in that as well and this is just to show you you know there's about 600 people um, we are like a completely non-asset based company so we don't have our own aircraft um, we basically manage the network that's available so we work with all the airlines we spend millions every year um, buying cargo space from the airlines um, but the cargo space that we buy is express products so it's a much more expensive type service um, that we are offering um, we are a true 24 7 organization so we are staffed around the clock because when does an AOG happen on a Friday evening right and then it's got to be sorted over the weekends so it's always very much mission you know the tough mission uh, uh, related and somebody having to be there and monitoring the shipment and unfortunately due to COVID nowadays there's many more restrictions um, there's huge challenges you know to do with being able to find space lift um, you know flights so the whole network is extremely impacted by this right now but Globally, we work with about 4,000 suppliers that obviously are an extension to us. So they have to really um, live our ethics and breathe our mentality. And um, we have industry specific control towers. So it's really like a mission control, you know, where around the clock these shipments get monitored, you know, booked, uh, 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 you know, uh, communicated with the client, etc., etc. Um, what we, what we focus on, of course, is custom tailor-made solutions. If you look at a freight forwarder, like a Kuhn and Nagel, for example, what these type of companies do is they ship, they ship slow, they ship cheap, you know, things like that. Um, then you have integrators, which are like a FedEx or a DHL, which is a little bit a step up. Um, with this COVID situation right now, they are the winners because they all operate their own aircraft. They have their own fleet usually. So if you look at DHL um, here in Europe, um, their main base is in Leipzig, Germany, and their airline is called European Air Transport. But you wouldn't know because of course it's all yellow colors and you know, DHL logo and there's a lot of um, other companies flying for these integrators. So yeah, FedEx, DHL, definitely the winners. However, um, unlike a freight forwarder, these integrators, they have a hub system. So they all fly in and out of hubs and everything happens in and out of these hubs. And once it's in that network, it's very difficult to interfere with that, you know. Whereas with us, we use everything, you know. We might, we, we might even, you know, charter a FedEx uh, aircraft, you know, for a specific mission. So we are more flexible and we have more options that we can use. And we've been around almost 40 years. So, you know, everybody knows us in the industry. Um, and that's obviously been very, very, um, you know, very, very positive uh, for when I started like 13 years ago and I was tasked to, uh, uh, you know, bring the name out in Europe a bit more because traditionally it's an American company and quite famous in the US. But now we are truly global everywhere, um, you know, with colleagues dotted around. Um, so we have um, three major control towers. One is in London, UK, and I'm attached to that. So this is where our 24-7 ops is based to look after everything that is not America. We have um, one in America, in Virginia, close to Dulles International Airport. 
and uh, that's also the Sterling headquarters. And we also opened a operation in Charles de Gaulle because, of course, you know, not just Brexit, but also, oh, sorry, Ivana, am I boring you? No, I'm joking. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. It is Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, you know, so we opened uh, a, a base in, in, in France because of Brexit, you know, and because, um, you know, uh, uh, to just have a European presence as well, which has proven to be a, a, a very good idea. And then have, you've got, uh, uh, um, you know, salespeople dotted around. There's not that many salespeople. We are very lean. So there's two of us in Europe. There's one in South America. Um, and then there's a few in, in the US, one in Singapore and one in um, um, uh, uh, Australia, Melbourne, um, and another one in Dubai. And that's pretty, uh, it's a pretty lean organization. Um, what's happened here? Hold on. So, sorry. So, I'm going to fly through this because I'm sure, you know, this is this is a, a little bit too much of a sales pitch. But um, basically, we support everyone, whether it's the big OEMs like, you know, the Boeings, the Airbusens, the Bombardiers, the Gulf Streams um, on various missions, you know, whether it is uh, when Bombardier first started to build the C-Series, which is now the Airbus 220. Um, so we got heavily involved in that on the regional jet side, on the business jet side, we even have a couple of people sitting inside Bombardier in their response center, so that, you know, when there is an AOG, things have to happen fast, we're at hand to help them out. Um, Gulfstream is another. Um, the only one that we do not work that much with is Dassault. Um, on the maintenance side, yes, but on the aftermarket support, not so much, because they have a completely different system in place. Um, we support maintenance facilities. So, you know, when you hear Lufthansa Technik, um, when you hear, you know, SR Technik, Heiko, all these big names, Collins Aerospace. Um, so all the maintenance and manufacturers, as well as the operators, airlines, big, small, you name it. Um, and the way we do it is obviously, you know, we, we meticulously plan what needs to be done. The customer really, they just need to call us, make one call, one email, say, I have a cr critical mission, help me out. Um, we usually know their requirement, you know, we would have prepared for this because um, no one can really use us unless they are registered with us and you know we have SOPs in place and we know their requirements and expectations. Then we set it all up for them because you wouldn't believe how complicated it can get sometimes, especially everybody expects you know things to be shipped on a door-to-door -door basis but you have so many different countries and different authorities so you know you try and ship something into moscow for example it is virtually impossible you try and ship into brazil it's virtually impossible you know as Ivana knows, Malawi, for example, right? Um, extremely, extremely challenging and difficult, you know, working with the authorities. So, you know, there's a lot that needs to be done. So you need to have these in-house experts, you know, that can help with import, export, etc. And then, of course, once it's all planned and all set up, then we support on a 24-7 basis, you know, by by working with the client and keeping them informed and we keep them informed in different ways and um, under this AOG umbrella what we do is you know we call it next flight out which is kind of a little bit like a standard thing where you say okay um, there's a part in in Chicago it needs to come to Frankfurt put it on the next flight get it there but sometimes the missions are more critical and then you need to step it up a bit so what do you do so you can offer a hand carry and we do a lot of hand carries. I mean, again, you know, COVID is putting a little bit of a damper on this because of all these, you know, um, quarantine restrictions and things like that. Um, but basically a courier grabs the part and hand carries it to wherever it needs to go. And of course that provides you with much more security because you know the shipment is being accompanied by someone, you know, there's somebody there who will keep it at all times. Um, when it gets really crazy, then you can also charter aircraft from us. 
And we've got some crazy stories, you know. We had a, a massive engine that needed to be moved, and the only type of aircraft you could use for that was an Antonov. And we sourced an Antonov, but it was halfway across the pond flying empty. And of course, when you throw a lot of money at it, you know, they're quite happy to turn around, come and, you know, load this engine and deliver it. So there's all sorts of crazy missions going out. Um, and then, um, you know, in terms of um, communication, technology is very important. So the way we um, inform our people is, you know, we are connected obviously to the airline systems. So we always know are the flights have they departed, you know, are they on time? What stage in the process is this um, shipment at? Um, and we communicate with the client um, through either our own portal where they can log in and they can do all sorts of things. They can book, they can track, they can run reports. You know, it's a very, very good system that our IT developed solely around customer requirement. So if you're ever bored and wanted to just go on our website, it's called, um, you know, um, sterling.aero is the website and quick online is our, is our online portal. But to make it even more funky, we now have a mobile application linked to your access as well. And that's extremely good for engineers on a Sunday, you know, that are maybe not having access to a computer and just wanting to see, you know, what is the status of my shipment? And then it will tell you, you know, there's 11 steps in this process. It's currently under customs clearance. Your estimated time of delivery of this thing is going to be at 17.05 p.m. So that's been very, very well, um, you know, received by people in the field. And um, once the mission is accomplished, you know, again, happy landings. And that was hopefully not a too boring, too long overview, but a little bit an insight into, you know, the world of AOG logistics. So thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, um, just shoot. Thank you, Karen, for that. That was wonderful. Thank you. I made you the host again. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Any questions from anybody? Hi, Karen. That was really interesting. I never knew what you did in real life. No. <laughs> I do have a day job, and I'm not kidding. It's crazy, you know. <laughs> because there's only such so few sales um, people throughout the world. You would have thought there's a lot more. Um, well. Yeah, there is there is a lot of salespeople as such around, but um, some some are called business development, you know. Okay. So these are people that go out um, and work, you know. Let's say let's say uh, for a maintenance company, um, because outside of the manufacturers, let's say let's take Bombardier as an example, right? Bombardier obviously manufactures aeroplanes. They maintain them, they repair them, they modify them. But there is third party companies who do exactly the same as well on the maintenance side. And they might have business development salespeople that go out and sell that service, you know. So there is a lot of salespeople, but um, it's usually a bit specialized in the different areas that they are active in. Okay, okay. Hey, my question is, I, I know I've been following on the safety side some of the new scenarios that we're running into as a result of the current situation and you know covid and um have you seen anything in your industry that's been affected in terms of the factories aren't putting out the parts or the transportation is delayed or the schedules of flights that you normally send things on and like how what are the disruptions and how are you dealing with them yeah so the biggest challenge right now is the network is not the same anymore that it used to be you know there used to be let's say <clears throat> 15 flights a day from Heathrow to New York probably on British Airways alone maybe 30 flights a day when you count all the others American Airlines United Delta you name it and overnight obviously 100% capacity is now down to 20 30% and um, what the airlines are doing right now is they're saying, sure, you know, you can still use us, but first of all, it's going to cost you much, much more money. Mm -hmm. um, it's become a little bit of a bidding war, which is a little bit unfair, right? Um, because they are saying, you know, the more you pay, the more guarantee you have this thing flies. 
um, and the airlines have become extremely creative as to how they are tackling this situation because of course you know most airlines right now are operating at 20 30 percent capacity tops the majority is cargo and cargo has become the winner you know um I, you probably have seen the pictures of where airlines have started to put cargo into the cabins and all sorts of redesigns came out how you can mix passenger with cabin this that, and the other um mix it with cargo so it's definitely a challenge um, and we have to really really double check everything we cannot rely just because it says there is a flight from A to B you can't rely on it anymore so for us it's become a real challenge and then of course being based in the UK this 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 monster called Brexit is rearing its head now as well yeah. right and that's going to affect um, you know customs duties and things like that because if there isn't a common customs tariff in place or agreement like you know Europe has with let's say a Switzerland or something then that's going to be the next um, that's going to be the next issue and that's why a lot of companies have or will pull out of the UK so Textron yeah uh, Cessna they're pulling out of the UK altogether because they don't just want to, but they're in Doncaster, you know, which is a bit off anyway. But they had a maintenance facility there, uh, not too far from where Ivana's family is, right? So, you know, it's, it is definitely a challenge. Yeah, definitely a challenge. So we're fighting the fight every day to double check. Has it been loaded? Um, I have an engine right now that needs to go to Chicago. It's been offloaded twice you know and the customer you can imagine and it's costing them 35 grand for this shipment to be told every day oh it's not going again today it's not going again meanwhile rolls royce is charging the client a daily fee because that asset is owned by rolls royce and they're charging yeah. them a daily fee you know so it's it's a nightmare yeah. there's a lot going on but security is always paramount and for us you know security as well as compliance. For us, a big thing is compliance. Um, so if you look at hand carriages, right, there's no way that you would send someone on a flight and he would just walk it through, you know, through Malawi customs, not stopping and Bob's your uncle kind of thing. You know, these are things that we can absolutely not do, you know, because of course we have big contracts with companies in place. So yeah, it's a challenge. It definitely is, it definitely is. Yeah, yeah it's, Karen, it's interesting. I, I was on a call. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go for it, Karen. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I was on a call yesterday, and um, one of the things that they're seeing a lot of is tail strikes because the aircraft are so light that the crews uh, aren't accommodating yeah. for it. So they're having all these altitude busts and tail strikes, and because of the light loads, which yeah. I thought was interesting because you're just they're just not mm. used to it. And what's happening is the numbers are right, but the pilots are back off after flying after a couple of months and even though they're being told they're still not used to it so mm. the anticipation is all of a sudden you're going to get a call for a lot more parts that you haven't needed to get and they're not available so mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. just kind of an interesting dilemma there but um i i yeah. have a i have a big conundrum at the moment because you know i have prospects that i haven't done much with before that are now coming to me and saying oh you know uh, uh can you help us can you help us because of course you are this specialist and everybody always thinks you know the funniest story was when you had this volcanic ash situation oh, i mean yeah. nothing was moving nothing yeah. And one of my clients is sitting in a in a cobra type mission meeting and nothing is moving and he's saying that's okay just call sterling you know <laughs> it's like you know a compliment but you know sorry you know we are dependent on the airline network so you know and you can't even get sent a charter or something you know but um <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's crazy that's crazy <laughs> but i think you know the more the airlines are facing out aircraft so british airways for example has faced out all the 747s mm. um and the older type triple sevens and right now they're mainly operating the 787 and the um a350s you know, and someone was saying to me, OMG, there's a, there's a British Airways A350 flying cargo from London to Brussels. This is ridiculous, you know. But of course, you know, the demand is so high 
right now with cargo and that's a little bit saving their bacon you know <laughs> yeah which area geographically do you tend to have more issues with? Yeah, so obviously Africa is a big challenge. South Africa is a bit easier. So like Johannesburg, you know, we yeah. have good, uh, we have a very good agent there. Um, I used to, there's a, there's a very high concentration of business aviation activity in Nigeria, obviously, yeah. um, you know, but then again, you know, uh, uh, it depends who it is for, you know, and then we would say we will send it as hold for pickup, which means I find the flight, I get it on the flight, I get it there for you, we let you know it's arrived, you take care of the rest and how you do it, you know, we, we clink ourselves out. Um, then, you know, Russia is obviously a very challenging region and then kind of like the bordering African kind, of like Tunisia, Morocco, very difficult. Okay, Spain, yeah. believe it or not, quite challenging because, you know, Madrid is not the same as Barcelona. Barcelona is not the same as the Canary Islands. So there's quite some challenges around Spain a lot of times when it comes to duty and customs. Um, then I would say, I would say, Australia is okay. Um, what about South America and those areas? It's it, South America is very challenging, but again, it depends who you work with, you know, because if it's, um, you know, if you are supporting um, LATAM or someone or TAM or whatever they're all called, um, you know, then, you know, again, you might be able to send it as a hold for pickup. But the problem with South America is, you know, one of my clients tried to send a whole lot of parts over there just on the off chance to support an important client of theirs you know because they had just taken delivery of a couple of those jets and the minute it arrived in brazil it becomes property of the um um military or something like that you know so customs it it, it became very challenging you know and i think these parts they are still sitting in Rio and not released. I have an issue right now where, you know, it's always around the paperwork as well. So I have an issue where a unit was sent for an operator to Macau and it's going to take us two years to get it out of customs. And why? Because they snagged it, because they said, you know, the paperwork, the, the commodity code of the actual part doesn't match the commodity code that we think this has to be under. So it went to court and all sorts of stuff, you know, it's crazy. And I'm so glad I don't work in that part of the, of the business. Well, that because would be frustrating. Oh, I would hate every minute of it. Yeah. I'm gonna try to sell the shit and have them make it happen. <laughs> I sell the magic and then they make it happen. Yeah. But when it turns into a nightmare, then obviously I have an issue again, isn't it? Do you have certain countries that you're not allowed to have deal relations with? Yes, of course. And it's mainly to do with uh, the embargoes that America imposes because, of course, the core of our company is America. So what would that be? Okay. Iraq, Iraq. Uh, Cuba, Syria, uh, Sudan. Yeah, all that sort of. Yeah, okay. exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, so there is embargoes uh, on certain countries. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you could like flip over to the English side and then send it that way, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there's possibly ways, you know, there's possibly ways. I mean, when I, before Sterling, I, I've been with Sterling 13 years and I've never really worked in logistics as such. My background was more maintenance. I worked for Bombardier in a service center. Um, and then I sort of worked with aircraft parts a lot. So I worked for two companies. Uh, uh, where I was basically selling aircraft parts and you know the, the company that I worked for previously because we had a UK base I would have been able to sell something to Cuba if I needed to you know um, so that was a little bit easier but from a transportation point of view you know um, it's a yeah, bit true yeah even though ultimately we are not responsible because we're only the go-between, you know? We are the means, uh, uh, what do you call it, like the, you know, um, the means to make it happen. But the responsibility always lays with the shipper and with the consignee. And the consignee is the one that's taking delivery, taking responsibility, and is the importer of records. So it's really, you know, that needs to be absolutely watertight. 
Very mm. interesting. Very interesting. Mm. 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 That's what I thought. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I thought, yeah, let's try. And 13 years later, you know, I'm still still doing it. <laughs> Thanks, mm -hmm. Great. Elizabeth, anything you'd like to say? I can't hear her. Mm -mm. No. No. You're on, Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, now very, very interesting, really. I, I enjoyed uh, listening to you because it was, was something that I'd never thought about very much. Mm -hmm. But it really must be a big challenge, really, every day. Mm. Every day, you know, I had uh, I had a very, very good uh, relationship with Iberia, you know. And every day, every day we would be doing stuff for Iberia, you know. And of course, since COVID, you know, nothing, nothing. And Iberia was hoping to be operating at 80% capacity by September. And it's not happening, is it? It's crazy. It's crazy. So much, Karen, for that. That You're was welcome. fantastic. You're welcome. Uh, have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Oh, you guys too. <laughs> nice to see your lovely faces. Thank Look you. after yourselves. And don't get too stressed. Thank you so much. Have a good one, everyone. Yeah. Bye, Laura. Bye, Laura. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, guys. Okay, bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Turn this thing off.